In the spring of 536, Theodahad, king of the Ostrogoths, sent Pope Agapetus to Constantinople in one last attempt to reach a peace agreement with Justinian. By this point, Belisarius was preparing to move into Italy, and Theodahad had gone back on his initial agreement with Justinian, so nothing short of an act of God was going to stop the invasion. Agapetus quickly realized this, and probably didn't push the issue too hard. While he was tasked with trying to reach a peace, he had ulterior motives when he decided to make the journey to the eastern capital. Agapetus was very eager to address a problem with monophysitism. Like other church controversies, monophysitism revolved around the nature of Jesus Christ. At the Council of Nicaea, it was promulgated that Christ was consubstantial with God the Father, but had also become a man on earth. Therefore, Christ had two natures, the divine and the human. The Monophysites believed that the divine nature of Christ overtook the human nature of Christ. At the Council of Chalcedon, it was promulgated that Christ had two natures, both the human and the divine, existing simultaneously within his body. This made Monophysitism heretical. But that did not mean that the Monophysites just gave up on their beliefs. In the mid-6th century, Monophysitism still had a sizable following and counted among their ranks one very prominent individual. Empress Theodora, the wife of Justinian. The emperor himself followed the Chalcedonian orthodoxy, but his wife held considerable influence, and she used that influence to get Anthemus, a Monophysite, appointed as the Patriarch of Constantinople in 535. As Monophysitism was heretical, Agapetus demanded that Justinian remove Anthemus. Justinian refused. The two men argued, and the emperor emphatically told the pontiff, quote, either you agree with us, or I dispatch you into exile, unquote. To which Agapetus replied, quote, I indeed am a sinner, yet I have desired to come unto the most Christian emperor, Justinian. Now, however, I have found Diocletian. This is a reference to Diocletian's great persecution of the Christians, which took place at the beginning of the 4th century. Agapetus then demanded a debate with Anthemus, and to this, Justinian agreed. The Patriarch and the Pope would argue their positions publicly. At the debate, Agapetus asked Anthemus to affirm his belief in the two natures of Christ, a belief that the Pope shared with the emperor. When Anthemus refused, Agapetus declared him a heretic, and Justinian now sided with the pope. Anthemus was deposed, and Agapetus consecrated Menas in his place. But the former patriarch didn't just disappear from history. He remained in the imperial palace, hidden with Theodora's backing. Agapetus didn't have much time to celebrate his victory, though. Shortly after this debate, the Pope fell ill. As his condition worsened, his ambassador to Constantinople, Vigilius, saw an opportunity. Vigilius recognized Theodora's influence and had tried to win her favor by expressing Monophysite sympathies. He promised the Empress that he would reinstate Anthemus if he were ever to become Pope. When Agapetus died on April 22nd in Constantinople, Theodora decided to back Vigilius to succeed him. Vigilius accompanied Agapetus' body back to Rome, believing that, with the approval of the Empress, he was bound to be the next Bishop of Rome. But back in Italy, Theodahad had other plans. He knew that he needed allies and wanted the next pontiff 
to be a man that he could trust. He believed that man to be Silvarius, a subdeacon, and the son of Hormistus, who had been pope from 514 to 523. Silvarius was put forth directly by Theodahad, without input from the clergy. The Liber Pontificalis tells us that someone, perhaps Silvarius himself, had bribed Theodahad heavily for this appointment, which could also explain why a subdeacon was elevated so quickly. However, it seems pretty likely that Theodahad's desire for loyalty was the biggest factor. The Roman clergy accepted the appointment largely out of fear that Theodahad would punish any dissenters, and Silvarius was consecrated in June of 536. Vigilius learned of the consecration when he made it back to Rome. He had apparently missed his opportunity. Silvarius may have had some loyalty to Theodahad, but the king was deposed after the Eastern Romans took Naples in the fall of 536. By December, Belisarius was approaching Rome, and it was Silvarius who turned the city over to him. Vigilius returned to Constantinople and persuaded Justinian to write a letter to Silvarius, asking him to reconsider his stance on Anthemus. When he received the emperor's letter, Silvarius is said to have remarked, Now I know that this affair has put an end to my life. Silvarius wasn't going to betray his faith to appease Constantinople, and he knew that it likely would not work out for him in the end. He replied to Justinian and Theodora, I will never do this thing to recall a heretic condemned in his iniquity. After receiving this response, Theodora cooked up a plot. She sent Vigilius to Rome with instructions either for Belisarius directly or for his wife, Antonina. Procopius writes that Theodora and Antonina had been rivals before this, but the empress saw an opportunity here to use the general's wife to achieve her goals. According to this account, the two women became close friends after these events. Regardless of who received the letter, the instructions were the same. Find a reason to get rid of Silvarius and replace him with Vigilius. The Ostrogothic siege of Rome began in the spring of 537, and here, an opportunity presented itself. Belisarius was very terrified that someone within the city would open the gates to the Ostrogothic army. And of everyone inside the city at the start of the siege, who might be more willing to betray Belisarius than Silvarius, the man who had been appointed because the enemy king wanted a friend to hold the position. So when a letter was discovered showing that Silvarius did indeed plan to open the gates to the Ostrogoths, it didn't take much to convince everyone that treachery was in the works. The letter was fake though. It had possibly been forged on Antonina's orders. But that really didn't matter at the time. The accusation was out there, and in a time of war and uncertainty, it was going to be taken very seriously. Belisarius summoned Silvarius to the Pincian Palace, where the general was headquartered during the siege. Silvarius went to the palace, accompanied by Vigilius and several members of the clergy. Only the Pope and the ambassador were permitted to enter. Once inside, they found Antonina laying on a couch with Belisarius sitting at her feet. Antonina addressed Silvarius, asking him why he had agreed to betray the city to the Ostrogoths. Before Silvarius could respond, a deacon entered the room and stripped Silvarius of the papal vestments. He then draped Silvarius in a monk's robe. And just like that, the Pope had been deposed without so much as a trial. Vigilius then suggested that the now former Pope be exiled to Anatolia. 
It was quickly announced to everyone outside the palace that Silvarius was no longer the Pope and was now a lowly monk. The clergy was summoned inside to select a new Pope and, of course, selected Vigilius, who had the backing of Belisarius. But Silvarius wasn't done just yet. While in exile, he found an ally in a local bishop who petitioned Justinian on Silvarius' behalf. The emperor agreed that Silvarius deserved a chance to clear his name. He ordered that the former pope return to Italy to stand trial, and if found innocent, he would be reinstated. But Vigilius wasn't interested in any of that. When Silvarius returned to Rome, he was immediately sent off into a second exile, this time to an island off the western coast of Italy. It was here that Pope Silvarius starved to death in late 537. Vigilius, meanwhile, never made good on his promises to Theodora. Anthemus was never reinstated, and Vigilius did not overturn the Council of Chalcedon. The Monophysite question would not fade away, and controversy with the Eastern churches would come to dominate Vigilius's papacy. And when the Pope and the Emperor butted heads later on, Justinian would not hesitate to show off his power. Music